Greetings once again, AP Calculus BC students. Mr. Record here from Avon High School, and we are going to be looking at our first example from topic 9.3. We're actually ending the parametric portion of unit 9 with topic 3 here as we move into this idea called arc length revisited. Now, if that sounds a little familiar to you, already talked about arc length in one capacity, you're going to now view it in a slightly different light. Let's take a look. So in the notes here for 9.3, all about finding arc lengths of curves given by parametric equations, we kind of take you a bit down memory lane here. It says, now that we've seen how parametric equations can be used to describe the path of a particle moving along a plane, seems like our next step would be to do some more calculus with it. And one of those things is to figure out how long a parametric curve is, or what is the distance from one point of a parametric curve to the next point. And we're going to be able to do this by recalling our wonderful friend, the arc length formula, from a previous topic. And I believe that was topic 8.13, which wasn't really all that long ago if you're following the sequence of the Advanced Placement Calculus course and exam description. So that particular um, formula, if you recall, says that you're going to integrate between a boundary, we'll call it x0 and x1, of the square root of 1 plus the derivative of your function squared. So hopefully that rings a bell. And I won't talk about how this was developed because I have that already outlined in a previous video where I think we just talked about taking little tiny increments of these line segments and applied the distance formula for a line over and over again and then eventually added them up and boom, here's what we end up with. Now, how does this change, you might wonder, with parametrics? Well, let's say that our curve is represented by the parametric equations x equal f of t and y equal g of t, which is very common. And we're going to go ahead and define the boundaries to be a to b. And I don't want this to confuse you about why am I using a to b here to develop my parametric versus x0 to x1. I just don't want you to think that they would be the same boundaries because it's very likely that they would not be the same boundaries uh, because our boundaries are are obviously going to be certainly tied to the parametric world rather than the rectangular world. And we know that dy over dx uh, would be the same as f prime of t in this case, which is always going to be a positive value in, in, in this instance. So what does this all mean? Well, if we start with our good friend, our distance formula, our arc length formula, if you will, from rectangular, we're just going to slightly manifest it as we move from one step to the next. So I'm going to outline the pieces that seem to be a little different from one step to the next. And hopefully you can see that these two yellow highlighted pieces are equatable because that is just the way that we find the derivative in parametric. dy over dx is dy over dt divided by dx over dt. That's pretty much what we were doing in topic 9.1. Now as we move to the next part, a couple of things are happening. The first thing that's happening is that I'm really getting a common denominator of dx over dt squared. So I guess I could liken that to the green things that I've highlighted in that third uh, part of this uh, equation. The third expression would be equivalent to just the number one that I have in that second expression. And then the other thing that's going on that's a little bit unusual is that I've decided to multiply the tail end of this by a dt and then I'm going to divide by the dt so as to not disrupt its value and just say, hey, I'm just really introducing a, a factor of 1. But all of this is going to make sense, I believe, in this next step. So what we're going to do in the next step? Well, we noticed a couple of things here. First of all, the square root of the dx over dt squared that's in the denominator is just going to leave a dx over dt. And that dx over dt will still be in the denominator, and it essentially will cancel with this dx over dt. What that does is this leaves this entire radical expression untouched, 
and then I only have this dt left at the tail end. And that's predominantly the reason why I wanted to use the boundaries a to b in this case, so that we know that those are equated to values of t and not values of x, which is what would be happening with this particular expression. And then, of course, you could always simple, uh, simply rewrite the dx dt as f prime of t and the dy dt as g prime of t using uh, the Lagrange type of notation in that particular instance. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. We're going to kind of move a little bit further into this and, and uh, lead you into an example next. So what do we have here on the next page? Well, we have our official arc length uh, formula, I guess, in parametric form here. And it's really nothing new that, than what we haven't gone through on the front page. So you've got uh, a situation where it's all housed together in this nice little box that you can find if you're studying the notes. And a couple of little pieces of caution here. It says, when you apply this arc length formula to a curve, you have to be sure that the curve is traced out only one time on that interval of integration. Uh, for instance, certain parametric curves, like if, if you looked at cosine of t equal x and, and sine of t equal y, that actually uh, would be traced out once on the interval 0 to 2 pi, but it would trace out itself twice on the interval 0 to 4 pi. Now, I'm not throwing this at you as a big red flag, like, oh my gosh, you're going to have to worry about this with every single problem. It's just one of those things that we want to kind of hide away in the back of our minds. Usually, a problem presented to you with the given interval for t is not going to double back on itself and be traced a second time. And then, of course, we have this idea of arc length and distance traveled are really one and the same. And I wanted to pose this to you because a lot of times questions on the advanced placement exam with parametric equations won't ask you using the phrase find the arc length. Instead, they'll ask you find the distance traveled considering a particle that might be traveling along that parametric curve. But it's the same question. Arc length, distance traveled in parametric, obviously you're still using the same formula. Nothing's changed between this um, sort of, uh, I don't know what color is that, this orangish, I, I can't even tell, this box up here, Theorem 9.3a, and this more salmon colored box that says arc length and distance traveled. All right, enough of the colors. Let's move on to our example. In example one, we're asked to find the arc length of the curve defined by x of t equal t cubed plus 2 and y of t equal 2t to the 9 halves power. And we're going to use the interval 1 to 3. And again, I know it's very easy to look at this and think, boy, those are some strange exponents, especially that 9 halves power. If you remember a little bit from topic 8.13, some of these equations have to be written a little strangely in order for them to be solvable by hand, because whenever you're integrating with this square root expression, boy, do we have the potential for all sorts of bad things to happen, because it could be difficult to integrate. Hopefully this one's not as such. So one of the first things that I might suggest is to go ahead and take the derivative of each of these uh, expressions, and I'm, I'm going to use the prime notation. It's a little bit easier. So x prime of t would be 3t squared, and of course the y prime of t would be 2 times 9 halves. It's just going to be 9, so that cleaned itself up a little bit, but when I subtract 1 from that exponent, I'm still looking at a pretty gross looking thing, 7 halves. All right, I think at this point we're ready to start putting together our formula for length. So the arc length would be the integration along the given boundaries, 1 to 3, so there's no mystery there. And this is going to be one of those many parametric equations that does not trace itself out more than one time on that interval. And then I'm going to take the square root, and then if you recall, we have to square each of these, right? Each of these will have to be squared. So I think we can probably do that mentally. Uh, 3t squared squared would be 9t to the fourth. Hopefully you follow that okay. And then for the 9t to the 7 halves power, squaring that, I would get 9 squared is 81. 
And then when I square the 7 halves, that's a matter of multiplying the 7 halves times 2, right? A power to a power would just mean that you multiply those exponents, and thus we end up with just with a uh, t to the seventh power, all with respect to t. Now, if you note, this is a non-calculator. It's a calculator inactive problem. So that means that we should be able to do this by hand. Uh, it's more likely than not that this could be a multiple choice problem come AP exam time. And so we have to start thinking about strategies by which we could integrate this. Wow. Okay, uh, there's not much out in front, so I don't see a u substitution working because there's nothing to match our derivative of u with. Uh, what about maybe doing some factoring? Do you notice any common factor inside this radical expression? And hopefully we all come to the conclusion that we can factor out a 9 as well as a t to the fourth power. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep that 9 and that t to the fourth inside of the square root like this. And then I'm going to be left with 1 plus 9 t to the third. Now hopefully you guys follow that algebra. Sometimes the algebra can be lost on us, so we're just basically dividing each of these terms by 9t to the fourth. Now some really cool things are about to happen. If we go ahead and take the square root of 9t to the fourth because it just so happens that this is a perfect square. Wow, what were the chances of that happening? <laughs> like it has to happen in order for us to be able to solve this with a calculator. So those are like little tools and tricks that you can use if you know that it's a calculator inactive problem. You gotta have that perfect square. And boom, there we are. At this point, I think we can now start to entertain the possibility of a u substitution. u would certainly be the contents within our square root, 1 plus 9t to the third, because the derivative of that u is a 27t to the second. And that's really what we want, right? The t to the second for sure is what we want. Make sure you swing that dt over. Yeah, we're not too thrilled about this 27 but we can fix that if you recall. So remember what we're going to do here. This three constant that we see right there is already going to come out in front. We're going to reciprocate this 27. I'll reduce that in the next step. We have our integration symbol. And now this is just going to become the square root of u with respect to u. Quite simple. Okay. Basically, the, the dt becomes the du as long as the t squared is there, and we divide it over the 27. Now I want to go ahead and change the boundaries. Let's go ahead and integrate this with respect to u and don't go back. We won't have to back substitute if we change the boundaries. So if I plug in, let's say, the upper boundary of 3, I end up with 1 plus 9 times 3 cubed. Now I, I, I want to make sure that this is something that's not going to be too terrible. Um, this is probably the worst thing that's going to happen on this problem. You're going to have to take 3 to the third, which is 27. Let's say we don't have a calculator, so we're going to do this the old-fashioned way. 27 times 9, that would be uh, 9 times 2 is 18, plus 6 is uh, 243. And then if we add this other 1, we're going to get 244. And like I said, I think that's the worst thing mathematically that's probably going on. Luckily, u of 1, the lower boundary, is not nearly as bad because 1 cubed is just going to be 1 multiply by 9 and add 1. You've got your 10. So brand new boundaries exist, 10 and 244. At this point, we're going to go ahead and simplify the 3 over 27. That's, of course, 1 ninth. Let's integrate u to the 1 half, which is u to the 3 halves, times 2 thirds. Now remember that 2 thirds, where does it come from? You're essentially dividing by 3 halves, which is what a half plus 1 was. And then I'm just going to reciprocate that to make our lives just a little bit easier. And then our boundaries can then run along this way. At this point, all that's really left to do is to... Uh, consolidate the 1 ninth times 2 thirds, which is 2 27th. Nothing else is going to happen there to reduce. And then really this u to the 3 halves, we, we 
we've discussed this before, it's very unlikely that you're going to get these pretty perfect squares here. About the only way that that would happen is if you had some really creepy boundaries of t that had square roots in them. So just go ahead and just plug the 244 in for the u, keep the 3 halves power attached to it, subtract 10 with the 3 halves power attached to it, and more likely than not, at least on my assessments with my students, that's about where I'm going to stop because I don't want to turn this into some kind of an algebra contest, an algebra problem that says, okay, well, how are you going to go ahead and, and simplify 244 to the 3 halves power? Of course, there's a way to do it uh, to write it a little bit easier, but for right now, this is what I'm kind of concerned with because I want to test your ability to set up the Arkling formula and just get a little practice in in trying to integrate it by hand. Hope this helps. We've got a couple of more videos coming up that deal with the uh, arc length. We're going to move into surface area also, which is not a BC topic to kind of round out your understanding of parametric equations and AP calculus. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.